So when we talk about what life is, right? Life is not a thing. You can't hold life or, you know, measure life or weigh life. Life is not a thing. It's not something that you have. It's a condition. It's something that you exhibit. Okay. So living things have lots of different shared characteristics. When we were doing that activity a moment ago, you could tell what was alive and what was not alive, but it took some work to figure out why that thing was alive and this other thing was not. It's a harder question to answer than immediately comes to mind. Okay. So some characteristics of living things, there's several of them. One of them is that it exhibits movement at some level. So obviously you and I move, right? I can click my heels. And we can move and do all kinds of things like that. Um, but when you look at like the tree, the General Sherman tree that I showed you, it is not jumping up and clicking its heels. Okay, it doesn't have heels, it can't click its roots. Um, movement doesn't always occur at a large macro organismic level. Corals are animals that don't really go anywhere. They live forever where they found themselves to be created. Um, and there's lots of things like that. There are some animals that could potentially move, but choose never to. Uh, when we get later into biology, we start studying animal groups. Things like sea lilies. They can, in theory, walk around, but once they find a rock that they like to grab, they'll grab that for the rest of their life. Um, and some things just can't move, like trees and plants and funguses. Mushrooms don't go on parade, right? But if you look at some level the organism does move even if you have to go all the way into the cell to find cellular movement in parts of cells that are in motion every living thing moves at some degree sometimes you can't see it um, but it's always there uh, internal even intracellular movement counts so when we do a uh, some photosynthesis labs later on you're going to watch what's called phytoplasmic streaming and you're going to see parts of cells that are just stirring themselves around so that all of the parts of the cell can come in contact with the light. And that's cellular movement, and that counts as, as movement. So all living things move in some way. That's the first requirement. All living things grow and develop. And so you started a lot smaller than you are right now, right? You were originally one cell, and now you're, you know, about two trillion cells. And that change from one cell to two trillion cells took time. It's called development and growth. And that also took you eating a lot of food because it takes fuel and stuff going into a living thing to make that living thing grow and develop and get bigger. So living things always grow and develop. No living thing stays the way it was when it was first created. Okay. If, if that were to be true, then it'd be really hard to imagine offspring of any kind. Imagine if, you know, your mom and dad were only as big as they were when they were born, okay? Five, six, seven, eight, nine pounds, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? And then they didn't get any bigger, but your mom had you. Well, now you're the size of like a peanut, <laughs> okay? And then if you didn't get any bigger, and eventually you have children, they're the size of, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a grain of sand. And so at some point it becomes ridiculous. So living things always have to grow in order to get big enough to have more of them. Um, and there's always some kind of development. Very few things are just like the adult when they're born, hatched, whatever. Um, there's always some kind of change, a, a, a human baby, is about three to three and a half heads tall, meaning the size of the baby's head uh, represents about a third to uh, to three and a half uh, you know portions of its body. You, closer to being an adult, right? You're about seven heads high, so your head is a lot smaller of your body than it was when you were born. So it's not as obvious in you as it is in a butterfly, where you know. We have caterpillar and we have cocoon and pupa and we have all these different stages. That's really obvious, but everything develops to some degree, even if even if it's just you going, you know, growing into your head. Um, so things grow and things develop, and things need food to do that. A process called assimilation, where there are things that used to be outside of me, and now they are part of me. Okay, 
So there used to be eggplants growing, and uh, the eggplants were not me. They were themselves. But today at lunch, they became a part of me because I had eggplant parmesan for lunch. And so my body is currently in the process of taking apart the eggplant and making it me. And so I am assimilating the eggplant. It's kind of like if you guys are, if anybody here is Star Trek fans, you know, the board, you will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Um, it's that idea, something that we didn't used to be a part of me. Now it's a part of me, um, and it's helping me grow and develop. Okay. So another characteristic of living things is that living things reproduce themselves. Okay. We all started with Adam and Eve, and now there are more than two people on the planet. Okay. Reproduction is part of living things, and if, if something is alive, it reproduces. It doesn't always have babies uh, in the sense of like what animals have babies, um, but they always reproduce themselves. Funguses uh, reproduce themselves, and, uh, and you know, viruses reproduce themselves. Reproduction is just a part of life. Re things reproduce. Sometimes it's really rapid reproduction. Um, you can start with two rabbits, and wind up with a lot more rabbits, what do you do? Okay. Uh, very, very, very rapidly. You can start with two pine trees though and take a lot longer to have baby pine trees. So reproduction can be very fast, reproduction can be very slow, um, and reproduction comes in two flavors, uh, sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, and so, <laughs> right? So there's the kind of reproduction where it takes, a, it takes two individuals coming together and mixing their genes to have the next generation occur. Um, and there's the kind of reproduction where that's not necessary, where an individual can just reproduce. There are some plants that don't take any kind of gene mixing, right? The baby just grows out of the roots of the parent plant. I'm glad humans aren't that way. You imagine trying to put your shoes on one day and you're like, oh, another baby. <laughs> 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 So, um, there's different kinds of reproduction, and uh, we don't need to get into the mechanics of that right now, right? Okay. So, another characteristic of living things is that uh, living things come from living things. And this it was not immediately uh, understood by scientists. It took a while to prove this concept, and it's going to be talked about in your book as well. The story of disproving spontaneous generation. But people used to think that life could come from non-living things. For example, there was the belief that if you put a pile of grain in the corner of the room, that mice would be created. Mice come to be out of the grain. No, silly person. The mice find the grain and say, hey, look, food. Mm -hmm. And then you see them there. Or that you could boil meat and make broth and leave the broth, which is not alive, in a jar and that maggots would form. No, the broth doesn't make the maggots. Flies come and go, ooh, yummy stuff that my babies could eat, and they lay their eggs, and then you get maggots, right? So um, this idea that life comes from life is actually uh, relatively young in the great big scheme of things, um, and is very important for us as believers, because if life only comes from life, well, then the whole idea of life originating out of some primordial soup is bupkis, is ridiculous, is ludicrous. And scientists who don't believe in God will teach their science classes that life comes from life. And then at the same time, they're going to teach them a couple chapters later that life came to be when some lightning bolt struck some slimy pond water and you have single cell organisms. And, and you know, I'm hoping that some student is brave enough to raise their hands in those kinds of classes and go, um, uh, Professor, Professor Johnson, uh, three chapters ago, you said life only comes from life. And watch their faces go, mm -hmm. because life only comes from life. And you don't have to be a Christian to believe that. Science teaches that everywhere. Um, and we know that life only comes from life. And the original story of where did life come from is not from some slime that got hit by lightning at the right time. The original story of where life came from is because God spoke it into existence. And from that moment forward, he alone is the author of life. Um, and so that's an important thing. Um, living things come from other living things. All living things have a pretty similar chemical makeup. If you look at the chemistry that is you, 
you are mostly uh, five different elements. You are largely carbon. The stuff of you that is not water is mostly carbon, okay? And then you're a lot of water, which is hydrogen and oxygen. And hydrogen and oxygen are used in other things besides water in your body. And then there's a lot of nitrogen in you as well. And then you have a, a good piece of phosphorus, okay? So those things, C-H-N-O-P, is, is mostly what you are, okay? And that's, that doesn't mean that you're only a pile of chemicals. One biology professor was famous for saying that he could buy everything it took to make one of his students for about $3, which is true if you were to just look at that amount of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus. But you are a lot more than $3 worth of chemicals from a supply store, right? Because it has to do with how you're arranged and how God knit you together um, and how he intended you to be who you are. But chemically, you're those five things. Um, and those five things are true of all living things. If you look at chemically, what is a tree? Chemically, what is a fungus? Chemically, what is a honeybee? They're all those, basically those five elements, okay? Um, and non-carbon-based chemistry we call inorganic chemistry. The study of carbon-based molecules we call organic chemistry because organic usually refers to light, okay? So living things are all pretty similar chemically. So the next two living things are composed of cells. And this was Leah's favorite one, and she figured it out good for her. Um, living things are composed of cells. Nothing which cannot be said to have at least one cell is alive. Like I said before, some biologists have started to accept viruses as a very, very simple form of life. But the majority opinion is still that they are not alive because they are not a cell. They don't have one cell. Um, but the amoeba that I showed you earlier, bacteria, they're all very simple one-celled forms of life. Some algae are single cellular, some funguses are single cellular. And if you have at least one cell, then you meet that criterion for being alive, okay? At least one cell. Living things also respond to their environment, a condition called irritability. Irritability, sometimes we think of as being grouchy, like, you know, uh, my kids start making noise early in the morning before I've had a chance to wake up and be my pleasant self. And they might say that I'm being irritable if they have that kind of cool vocabulary. Um, irritable sometimes we mean it's like grouchy, but in the sense of biology, it just means something happens and I respond. So in that example, Tegan walking into the room early in the morning and saying, hi, daddy, and she gets from me. That's just me responding to my environment, right? That's me being irritable. But later in the day, when I'm awake, and she says, hi, daddy, and I give her a big hug, that's also me being irritable, right? I'm responding to my environment. So <laughs> living things respond to their environment. And uh, that, that biological vocabulary word is just called irritability. And the last one is that the inside of a living thing does not change as much as its outside. So they maintain a constant internal condition. Uh, the word we use is homeostasis. Stasis means not going anywhere, static, right, unchanging. Homeo means similar. And so the, both, both of them have to do with the same idea. The inside of a living thing is similar. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't change very much. And uh, stasis, static, speaks to the same idea. So, for example, my internal body temperature is 98.6 degrees because I currently am not ill. Um, and I'm in a room right now that's right about 70 degrees. My body is warmer than the outside. I walk outside now, though, and, you know, you could walk into a day that's hotter than your internal body temperature. Not very often in Hawaii, but in certainly in Phoenix or several parts of, of the country, you can walk outside and it's hotter than your internal body temperature. And then your body starts to do things to cool itself off. You start to sweat, you start to uh, breathe differently, and it does all kinds of things to try to cool you down. You, your skin will flush as the blood goes out to try to dump heat. Um, and it'll try to do things to keep you cool, to maintain homeostasis. But then you could go to where I moved from to Flagstaff, where I, I, I came from Flagstaff to here, and in the middle of the winter in Flagstaff, it's, you know, negative 10, negative 20. I've been in negative 40 degrees. And you walk outside at negative 40 degrees, 
and your body responds. It's trying to keep the inside of you at 98.6. So it does things like take blood away from the surface of your skin to conserve all the heat that you can. And it does things like make you breathe very shallow so that you're not losing the heat of your lungs out to the outside air. And you shiver to try to build up metabolic heat from your muscles and your hair stands on it to try to create a dead air space like your hair becomes your own sweater, right? Um, and so all those things happen to try to keep the inside of your body at a certain temperature. Um, and homeostasis can be measured in lots of different ways in lots of different organisms. Not all organisms care about their internal body temperature, but all living things maintain a very complex internal environment. And they try to keep that environment unchanging, even though the outside environment changes, okay? Um, one, just another body heat sort of story. Um, there's a research station run by British people in Antarctica, and they have this like initiation for people who are there for the first time. They have a, a hot tub inside the research station, and it's, you know, hot tubs are hot, 100 and something degrees. And you're sitting in the hot tub, and then they will tell you to get out of the hot tub and run outside in Antarctica in the winter where it's negative 60, 70, 80 degrees, right? and go from 100 degrees to nearly negative 100 degrees and uh, run out and touch the flagpole, which is about 100 feet outside the door, and then run back in and get back in the jacuzzi, and it's called the 300 degree dash because your body temperature goes from, you know, positive 100 to negative 100 and then back up, and, they, and it's, it's a ridiculous abuse of your body, but they make new interns do it. So, um, yeah, so the, the people who are forced to do that, their internal body temperature probably changes because that's really rapid, but it's trying to keep homeostasis, trying to keep things unchanged. Okay? So those are the characteristics of living things. What questions do you have?